major difference between the consequential anarcho-capitalism, uh, which is cost-benefit analysis of, of state, state versus non-state, and uh, natural law anarcho-capitalism is really in the reasons for each, not really in methodology of uh, how it would work. Well, that's, right? a, that's a little complicated because in practice, I think people who try to derive their anarcho-capitalism from moral arguments tend to imagine that the way you get a law code is that legal philosophers figure out what the law ought to be and then everybody follows it. Whereas the model that I've described in Machinery of Freedom is one in which the law itself is being produced on a competitive market, in which individuals are choosing the firms that will protect their rights. Each pair of firms is choosing a court that will settle disputes between its customers so that they won't have to fight each other. The courts are then generating laws trying to have the legal rules that people want to live under so that they will be able to sell their services. And you therefore, in that model, have a legal system which itself is coming out of the market rather than derived by philosophers. Now, I could certainly, there's no reason why somebody who believes in a natural rights argument couldn't be in favor of my system. But I think that in practice, if you look at how the arguments have developed, there tends to be a sort of double division between anarcho-capitalists whose argument for anarcho-capitalism is it produces the kind of world most people would want to live in, and those whose argument is that everything the government does is a violation of rights, and therefore you're not, it, it's wrong to have, to have a government. Would it be fair to say that pertaining to laws in, in an anarcho-capitalist society that uh, natural rights, anarcho-capitalists, they, they would end up with some laws that are written in stone, whereas uh, the consequential anarcho-capitalism, would, everything would be uh, actually up to the market? Yeah, that is the... I don't know what the natural rights an agro-capitalist would end up with. After all, when the legal philosophers figure things out, they might not come up with the conclusion the libertarians like. Uh, but I think they imagine such a system. They imagine a system where the basics of law are set by what's right, and then details, uh, you know, how many signatures it takes to, for witnesses to a contract or something could be mm -hmm. up to the negotiation. Uh, but the, but I think the more fun, I mean, that's, there re, it's really two disagreements. One of them is how you imagine the society working, and the other is what the arguments are for it. And in my view, I mean, the, let me give the other side. The natural rights argument, people would say, how can you have a consequentialist argument? Because you need moral views to evaluate your consequences. How do you decide what are good consequences or bad consequences? And my answer to that is, that in practice, most people have enough agreement about what they see as good, and the anarcho-capitalist system is enough better by their standards than the alternatives, that if we could settle the question of how the system would work, of what outcomes it would provide, most people would agree in supporting it. So that if, suppose somebody says the trouble with a libertarian or an anarcho-capitalist that really, the arguments really apply however far you go, is that it doesn't redistribute in favor of the poor. And one answer that a natural rights person would, 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 would make is the poor are not entitled to have other people's money. But a different argument is why do you expect political institutions to help poor people when, after all, poor people are not very well politically organized, they don't have much money to bribe politicians with, and if you look in the real world, you observe that governments do buy the votes of the poor, sometimes by giving them welfare money, but then they also do quite a lot of things, such as having professional licensing so that a poor person can't decide to be a barber, because in order to be a barber in many U.S. cities, you have to take several hundred hours of classes. And why do you do that? Because the existing barbers want to keep down competition. Uh, it's true of many, many other professions, but there are a whole lot of ways in which the state intervenes in order to help whoever are the ins at the expense of the outs. I suppose the very largest ones of those would be restrictions on immigration, where uh, there are many millions of people who would much, live much better lives if they were free to come to the U.S., which in a libertarian society they would be, but are prevented by the U.S. immigration, immigration rules. So in general, one argument is to say what you want is immoral. 
Another is to say, you're imagining that not only you have a state, but you are running it. But you wouldn't get to run the state any more than you would get to run the anarchist society. The state will do what the state will do. And such evidence as we have suggests that societies with strong states are not particularly good for the poor. I remember a long time ago I read one of Solzhenitsyn's novels. And what struck me about it was that the difference between the life of a uh, physician in Soviet Russia, which is what he was, or at least what the character was, I don't remember if you know. One day in the life of Ivan Denisovich? Probably, yeah. And, and, and the woman who cleaned his house. That the difference between them was much larger than the difference between me and the people who I hired to, to, to clean my house. Uh, I'm richer than they are. I have a better life than they do. Not very much better. That they, you know, live in the same kind of circumstances. Almost certain they do, in fact, own a car. They own color televisions. Uh, and they are getting better and better off. That, that typically, they, they're, the people who clean my house are Mexican immigrants, probably legal Mexican immigrants in our case, so they wouldn't have to be. Uh, but those people in a generation or so tend to sort of merge into the general society and be about as well off as other people. Uh, and that wasn't happening. And in fact, uh, one, ha one heard stories probably true in the U.S., of people who would have an arranged marriage in order to get permission to come to the U.S. One heard similar stories in Russia about people who wanted to come to Moscow. So that the difference in status between the elite in the Soviet Union who were largely in Moscow and the mass of the population was much larger than the difference between people who live in New York and people who live in Idaho, uh, say. Uh, that in a way what the Soviet Union was, was a third world country with a first world military and a first world elite. Uh, so, so it seems to me that, that, it, that it's more effective for libertarians, whether anarchists or not, to say that you will get whatever you want, almost whatever you want, you are likely to get more of it with less government rather than with more government. I think that's more effective than trying to persuade people you shouldn't want it. Because moral philosophy is really not a very advanced science. We haven't made a lot of progress in philosophy in the last few thousand years. And I don't think anybody has come up with a really convincing argument to show that you shouldn't enslave people, you shouldn't kill people. Most of us feel you shouldn't. I feel you shouldn't. But if somebody says, I want to enslave people, there's no way I can prove to him that he shouldn't. But if I say, look, if you have a society where people can be enslaved, you might end up as the slave. That's a pretty convincing argument for why you should be in favor of a free, free society.